Ahoy, this is David Perry with my continuing series of interviews with friends, colleagues, artists, and professionals talking about how they and their work go from the great pause of this year of COVID into the great return. And I'm very proud to have with me a longtime colleague and friend and one of the foremost curators and historians about the Chinese and Chinese American experience in the world. Please welcome Sue Lee. Sue, welcome. Hi, how are you? I was wondering who you were introducing. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I have been in public relations for a long time, but it's all true. So, Sue, uh, for people who are not familiar with you, talk about your history in San Francisco, which of course starts with your birth. And then when I first met you, when you were working at the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, and then with the Willie Brown administration, please. Right. So I'm a San Francisco native, third generation. My grandfather arrived in San Francisco in 1915 and went into the cigar business. So I grew up in a three generation family. The, the first one to go to college, actually. Um, after college, I came back to San Francisco Chinatown to work in the community, to give back, to try to help the community, because at that time, Chinese immigrants were coming in great numbers into the country. Um, and so I started working uh, for a community nonprofit and then went to work at City Hall for a, count, a supervisor, Nancy Walker, in 1980. And then I came back to the community after 20, 22 years at City Hall. Um, I met David at the Chamber of Commerce, where I was public policy VP, um, and then um, became the executive director of the Chinese Historical Society of America in 2004. Well, and that brings and us to the present conversation, because during your many years at the Chinese Historical Society of America, and it's historic national landmark building designed by Julia Morgan, a Bay Area architect, you discovered a series of paintings that have become iconic and are about to have new life because you literally uncovered them. The work of Jake Lee. Talk to us about those paintings and the importance of the artist, Jake Lee. Actually, it was an ad the adventure of my lifetime. Um, we received a anonymous email in our general info email box telling us about an art auction in Pasadena in less than a week um, that was going to auction off 11 paintings that had been hanging in the iconic Cannes restaurant uh, for almost 30 years. They had disappeared. The community thought they had been destroyed, um, but these images were part of Johnny Can's strategy, if you will, to share not only the culinary heritage of Chinese, but to share the Chinese American heritage of his restaurant and of Chinatown. So Jake Lee was commissioned to paint 12 scenes and they were historically accurate and they're visually just so enticing and appealing. It was amazing. So. I went after those paintings. As a historical society, we have never bought anything. Everything is donated or scavenged, or you go dumpster diving and you find these treasures. So to go to an art auction was really out of our comfort zone. Um, we don't have a big treasury, um, but some very uh, loyal donors were uh, uh, very struck by this um, opportunity. And so they pledged funds. So I went to that art auction in Pasadena and made like an art collector. It was terrific. What did it feel and like I, playing? What did it feel like portraying a, a big deal auction goer? Oh my God, the adrenaline rush. You know, you put up your paddle, you're, you're, you're competing against other bidders, and then they applaud you when you win. And you won. <laughs> and I won. I brought back seven paintings from that auction. There were 11 at the auction, so I got seven. Four of them went to one individual collector from Kern County. And that's what uh, brings us to the present moment. Yes. So I made sure to stay in touch with George, the private collector, and I tried to persuade him early on that those paintings belonged in a collection. They were meant to be seen as a collection, and they really didn't belong in his living room. So, and over the years, George and I became friends, and 10 years later, 
he has said, you know, you're right. Those paintings belong with the others. And so he has now um, agreed to transfer them to the Chinese Historical Society of America to reunite this collection. And of course, in the meantime, I had found the 12th painting. Um, so the, the collection is now intact and we need to raise a little bit of money. Um, George is allowing, allowing the Historical Society to purchase them at, at the cost that he paid for them 10 years ago. And I'm thinking, oh. I shouldn't have bid so hard. <laughs> you wouldn't have paid that much for them. You but in any, case, in any case, we have an opportunity to showcase the entire collection. And at this time, when we as a country are grappling with uh, the lack of inclusion in our historical record, uh, the paintings really provide an opportunity to show early Chinese in America. You know, most people don't know this story because of our immigration history. You know, the most Asians in this country came, have come since 1965. Hmm. These paintings were created in the late 50s and, and shown in the beginning in 1961. So those of us who have grown up with that history are really few and far between. So it's not just educating the Asian community, but the broader American public about the early contributions of Chinese. Well, of course. I mean, one of the many things that I've learned from you over the years and working with the Chinese Historical Society of America was the complete whitewashing of the history of the building of the transcontinental railroad, though that famous photo of the driving of the golden spike. Uh, it's all white guys. Uh, there's right. no the, the champagne photo, right? The coming right. together of the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific. So and no it, Chinese. And it wasn't that like the Chinese laborers were a small part of the project. They in a very real sense united the east and west coast of this country. Right. There were at least 12,000 Chinese who built the Central Pacific side of the transcontinental. And until last year at the 150th anniversary of the coming together of the two, of, of the, the transcontinental, the stories of Chinese have been not, not really told. They were forgotten. They weren't, we didn't know that much. And so it took about a five year um, uh, project a five-year effort by multiple groups of people, individuals, to tell a complete story. So in a way, you know, waiting 10 years to reunify this collection is nothing compared to waiting 150 years to tell the transcontinental so, story. So to say that the history of the Chinese-American experience is a passion of yours is a bit of an understatement. Yeah, you know what's funny, having been in public policy at City Hall all those years, actually the mo my most rewarding work has been working with the Chinese Historical Society and recovering our stories and finding and identifying the voices so that we tell our story in our own voice. So when you were a young woman, do you remember eating at Can's restaurant and seeing these paintings? No. We, we didn't, nope, we ate in Chinatown restaurants, but my family never went to Cannes. So all my information about Cannes is second, third hand. And I, you know, I go, Josh, we missed out on the glamour and the, the mystique and the, the fame of Cannes restaurant. It oh, was so, really so Cannes was quite a restaurant. sophisticated, uh, upscale experience, Cannes was. Oh. Absolutely. It was white tablecloths. It was, you know, it was uh, a crystal. It was China. It was the Mater D in a tuxedo. Um, it was, you know, you had to be dressed to eat at Cannes. Johnny Can positioned Cantonese food. He says, we do not serve chop suey. This is Cantonese cuisine. It is a cuisine. There is a heritage and history to the food. Um, and so his place, his, his restaurant was the place for celebrities to come to Chinatown. Um, Herb Cain was a fan of Johnny Can and the restaurant and would write about the, the celebrities who showed up, whether it was Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe in 1953 when the restaurant opened, or Cary Grant, or, you know, all these stars. Now, not to get too far afield from the paintings, but since we're on the, the topic of 
culinary experiences in Chinatown. You also are friends and neighbors with perhaps the foremost and most famous purveyor of Mandarin cuisine, probably in the world, uh, Cecilia Chang, who, as I understand, is about to celebrate her 101st birthday. Yes, I happen to be a neighbor of Cecilia's. I've gotten to know her over the years. So it's really interesting to me that here I am working on a project uh, that's connected to Johnny Can, who was promoting Chinese food, the Cantonese food, and then to, be, to know and have met and work with Cecilia, who promoted the greater cuisine of China. You know, it's Sichuan, Hunan, uh, Mandarin food. Um, so it's, it, it, they actually, I found photos of Johnny Can and Cecilia Chang promoting Chinese food during Chinese New Year's for San Francisco. Um, they work together. I've heard stories from Cecilia about Johnny Can and their work. And, you know, they were quite a team. It's, it's quite amazing. So they were, they were friendly competitors in a way because her restaurant was the Mandarin, correct? Her restaurant was at Garodelli Square mm -hmm. and Johnny Can was in Chinatown. So very different um, approaches to promoting their food, but very much complementary. Yeah, now so Johnny is no longer with us, correct? Right, Johnny but, passed away in 1972. But Cecilia at almost 101, she's in great shape. Absolutely, yep. Well, I'm, 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 I'm going to say this on the air so you can show this interview to her when it airs. I would love to interview her, tell her to get in the Zoom room with me. I think it would be incredible. <laughs> I'll pass it along. Please do. I met her once, uh, and of course, it was, a, it was a great honor. In our last few minutes, talk to me a little bit more about these paintings. You said that there were originally 12, so you bid on seven. You're raising money to get the other four. Tell me if I'm wrong, isn't there a story about a garage or a mechanic or, or some place where you discovered one of these paintings? Well, that's the 12th painting. So yes. the four that George got was at the auction, but I always wondered why are there only 11? You don't commission an odd number. It had to be an even number. Is that so because there were that, is that, would that be bad luck in Chinese uh, tradition? Is that why? No, not, not, has nothing to do with, you know, any kind of anything like that. It was more like, why would you commission 11? You know, it didn't, it didn't ring true to me. So in fact, there was a 12th. And what happened was when, when cans closed, the paintings were stored by a busboy and then forgotten about. <laughs> and so the busboy opened a auto repair shop in the Bayview. And I learned about this after I came back from the auction in Pasadena and went directly to that auto repair shop. And the, lo and behold, there is this nine foot mural on the wall of the auto repair shop. And it, it depicts a story of the championship fire hose team of Deadwood, South Dakota in 1888 when the Chinese raced down Main Street of Deadwood in this competition. And it's stunning. And, and to, to, for Jake and Johnny Can to promote this, this episode in Chinese American history is really stunning. You know, we on the West Coast think, oh, we know everything about Chinese Americans, right? We knew not, you know, and here, this, this little known episode happened in 1888, and it's in this eight foot mural. So is it still in the garage? No, the, I was able to take that mural back to the Historical Society the very day I visited the auto repair shop. Did he, it did he give it to you? Or did, he just, did he give it to you? You buy it or just yes. trade a muffler? Yes, he just said, do you want to take it? And I did. Wow. It just makes my heart beat, you know? It doesn't. That adventure was, was so amazing. And he was a busboy at Cannes, and he didn't realize the artistic value of this. He just thought, they're nice. I, yeah. I don't think that anyone really appreciated the artistic value. They thought it was restaurant decor. Johnny Cannes had a 
uh, um, banquet room upstairs from his regular dining room that had no win that had no windows, and so he decided to put artwork on on the walls. He had Tom Shea, who was a young architect at the time, design the room. So it was gold blocked wallpaper, you know, um, and you had these stunning paintings on the walls and then you would dine on Cantonese cuisine in the banquet room. So because of Su Lee's persistence and a bus boy who hid some paintings away and then opened a garage, we have now a dozen after this purchase goes through just unprecedented and unique depictions of Chinese and Chinese American life that don't exist anywhere else. Right, art historians, uh, Chinese American histor historians say this is, a, you, this is the only collection of its kind ever. And Jake Lee was a very talented, skilled painter. So they are artistically and visually uh, 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 stunning. Um, and historically, they are also important because they tell this story of the forgotten uh, contributions of Chinese, the industries that Chinese worked in, whether it's shoemaking, cigar making, they're carving out wine caves in Sonoma, Napa, uh, shrimp fishing. It has a, an image of the railroad building and then an image of gold mining. So you've got the two anchors of Chinese American history that drew Chinese to this country to begin with. And then you've also got these, these um, very uh, uplifting, um, appealing images of lion dancing and Chinese going to ch Chinese theater, to a real theater in San Francisco Chinatown. And then you've got lantern making, which is another part of Chinese culture and heritage that is lost. So you've got the whole package. You can show, so I'm really excited at the prospect of displaying these 12 and telling the stories individually and collectively. So we've got this chapter of early Chinese American history that we can tell through these, this collection. And what happened to uh, Jake Lee? Has Jake Lee passed as well? Jake Lee passed away. He uh, lived the last 40 years or so of his life in Los Angeles. He was a, he was a commercial illustrator. He um, illustrated Westways magazine, among others, which is the Automobile Club of Southern California. Um, there have been two or three exhibits of his commercial work of his California watercolors, which is of, of uh, birds and barns. He actually worked for the Air Force and painted Air Force, um, painted for the Air Force. So those images have been displayed in public. But his work as a chronicler of Chinese American history has not had the exposure. And so in a way we are rediscovering Jake Lee. So our first exhibit 10 years ago was finding Jake Lee. So now we're rediscovering his work. Well, I think for this, for this strangest of, of years, it is going to be really very fitting for when we are all able to go back into museums like the Chinese Historical Society of America to see this incredible collection put together because of the perseverance of Su Lee. And I can tell you, having known you for many years, it is hard to say no to you. So I'm sure you're gonna raise the money. Uh, any closing thoughts in our last 30 seconds? Well, you know, during this time where we're facing the pandemic, it's nice, it's, it's uplifting, it's encouraging to have something so positive to work on. You know, it gives you some hope. Great. Well, thank you. We've been speaking with Sue Lee. And uh, Sue, I'm challenging you, go upstairs or downstairs or next door, tell Cecilia Chang, I want to get her on the show and I won't take no <laughs> for an answer. Thank you, everyone. We've been speaking with Sue Lee. This is David Perry. Ahoy. Bye.